Okay, well, thank you very much for coming this morning. That was a great talk we just heard. We're going to be trying to build on that now with these different breakout sessions. This talk is about planning and public health. Uh, we have on our panel here um, Peter Bella with the Alamo Area Council of Government is going to talk on air quality issues. Christine Vigna, uh, role of transportation planning from VIA. Uh, Aza Kamel about planning and education. John Austin about new urbanism is with the Development Services Office. And I'll just be the moderator, John Dugan. I'm director of planning for the city and talk a little bit about uh, city planning issues and our comprehensive plan. So to start off with, um, modern city planning and public health practices both emerged to protect communities from epidemic diseases in industrializing cities about 150 years ago. As diseases subsided, the disciplines took two separate paths. Planning improved quality of life through provision of jobs and housing and regulations of the built environment, while public health focused on disease and treatment, uh, education, health care, and nutrition, and individual health behaviors. Planning and public health departments today have very different responsibilities and seldom develop mutual policies or interact too much. Today there is, though, an increasing number of deaths from chronic illnesses such as heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and asthma. Research confirms that the illnesses are directly affected by the character of the built environment. Community design can significantly affect violent crime, physical activities, diet, pollution-related illnesses, accidental injuries, and other health conditions. So the character and the quality of our built environment certainly is of concern to both disciplines, and of course that's why we're gathering here today. A renewed cooperation between city planning and public health is about addressing the full range of factors affecting health. Individual health behaviors, lifestyle choices, improved access to education, employment, healthy working conditions, healthy transportation options, health services, and nutritious food. And a quality physical environment in neighborhoods that support public health. In San Antonio, we've embarked recently on a new comprehensive plan that tries to change the model that we just heard about. Our plan initially was adopted in 1978 and really hasn't been updated since then. So we're way, way behind on incorporating some of these concepts into our development policies. The comprehensive plan simultaneously addresses land use, transportation, environmental resources, public services, economic development policies as they further community health. So our primary goal of our plan should be the development of a city of healthy communities. And that's what we're about. Today we're going to hear from our panel uh, from different perspectives on what a healthy community and a healthy city is about and what we might be doing in the future. And then we'll open it up for questions or comments from you all. So thank you very much. And I'd like to first introduce, uh, I'd like you to just sort of let everybody give their presentation and then we'll have a 20 or 30 minutes for open questions. So we'll start off here uh, then with Peter Bella from Alamo Area Council of Governments. Good morning. Thank you again. My name is Peter Bella. I am the director of the Natural Resources Department with the Alamo Area Council of Governments, and what that means is air quality planning throughout the region. What you've heard this morning so far has a number of takeaways, one of which is the value of incremental growth. I think that one of the challenges we see here in the San Antonio region is that we're really booming in population, and there's the economic development factor produced by the Eagleford development, which is beyond or is not within, let's say, is not within that kind of paradigm of contemplative planned growth patterns. There are a lot of issues that have to do with large, uh, quick growth that we're seeing here today. However, when it comes to the built environment, what I'll do in a, just a couple of remarks that I have is focus on why the built environment has links to air quality. That's the right button. 
What I do professionally is I do planning involved with ozone. There is ground level ozone. Our region is currently struggling to maintain our good air quality when you measure against ozone, the ozone standards. So the first concept is that ozone presents health risks. It's as you breathe ozone out in the streets, it'll be the elderly, the young, those with pulmonary impairments that know it first when they're breathing levels of ozone, high levels of ozone. It's an important enough health risk that there are federal rules, federal standards, clean air standards that apply. So just the first paragraph you see above the table is the actual statement of the federal ozone standard. Basically, there are air quality monitors throughout the region. The ones we care about most are here in Bear County. They record ozone levels, and the rule says, take a look at your highest ozone levels, pick the fourth highest every year, average those together over three years at every one of the regulatory monitors, and that's the number we care about. What this table shows is that while the standard says must not exceed 75 parts per billion concentration in the atmosphere, our most recent full three years of data set against the rule says we're not doing too good. So in fact, in 2012 and in 2013, and even now, this early into the season, because it's a three-year average, our numbers are high enough in 2014 for that three-year average that the San Antonio region is exceeding, is violating the federal air quality standards. So that represents health risk. And if we cannot find our way to make our own reductions, we will then be deemed in non-attainment. That is, it's a status the federal government, the EPA, assigns that says, you guys, you had, had a chance and you couldn't quite get there yourself, so we will come in and we will apply rules in the region that will be the process for getting you back in. So what causes ozone? I'll simplify this in the sense that while there are these two classes of gases, as I call them, these two families, the oxides of nitrogen is the ones I'll focus on. The oxides of nitrogen are typically produced by high temperature, pressure, internal combustion processes, power, power generation, 18-wheelers, the cars and trucks we all drive. Those sorts of high temperature and pressures are what it takes to make nitrogen and oxygen form NOx molecules. VOCs, I won't focus on them so much, the volatile organics, the paints, the thinners, a lot of different gasoline vapors, a lot of different vapors that have organics in them. I won't focus on them too much. And the reason that I won't focus on them too much is because, as you see at the very bottom there, we control ozone by controlling these precursors. When these guys go up into the atmosphere and they cook in the sun, that's when they become ozone. We've got to control the oxides of nitrogen. So I'll just conclude with those remarks on NOx, oxides of nitrogen. This trend shows something pretty admirable. This trend shows that as the San Antonio region grows, San Antonio region being the San Antonio, New Braunfels metropolitan statistical area, as the region has grown in population, we can see a downward trend in the production of oxides of nitrogen, a downward trend in the production of NOx, which is what it takes to help get us there. So if I look at, let's take a little closer look. If I look at that, that uh, 2012, oh, so there, there it is, that 2012 marker for NOx. OK, what's in there? Well, these are the constituents. These are the sources. And I've taken out and outlined the two largest of them. On road, the cars and trucks we all drive. Again, 18 wheelers on the road too, sure. The cars and trucks we all drive and power generation. Again, think of those industrial processes, the high temperature and pressure inside your car's engine, power generation, and others. Cement, petroleum industry, and that's traditional petroleum industry. This does not include the Eagleford emissions. And here's where the point comes. Very quickly, very simply, it means something to us because the built environment, as you design places that are walkable, as you design places that have local infrastructure that supports a dense community. On-road vehicles and power generation, I mean, if you're part of the problem, that means you're part of the solution. 
So we look to on-road vehicle and power generation emissions reductions. Reduce fossil fuel consumption. That's not only renewables, but that's energy efficiency. So energy efficiency in building design, the envelope design, construction, sort of the micro scale, compact walkable communities, mass transit and transit oriented development, master plan communities that are efficient in their planning. These are all processes that mean growth doesn't have to mean greater pollution. So that's simply my outline. And uh, I would welcome you to join with me on the fight to control the fight of, uh, well, let's fight smog. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Okay, now we've got John Austin talking about new urbanism approaches to planning. We've had to speed this up, too, because we're a little bit behind, so, uh, but we'll get the, the focus on all these different talks. Okay, I think this is better. All right, um, this is our uh, first slide with public health and built environment. And um, we heard before uh, from the chat that you know, uh, financially we are, the, the way we're growing right now, that uh, we might be or maybe will be you know, facing some issues uh, down the road. We just heard from uh, Peter that uh, you know, the way we you know, uh, conduct our lives, especially in terms of transportation and uh, uh, related to it, of course, land use, uh, development patterns, uh, that uh, we will be, you know, facing some issues. And right now, I would like to focus on uh, the uh, how built environment, not in terms of producing gases, but just the how we, um, you know, function physically in the built environment uh, is uh, affecting our health. Uh, public health officials and experts telling us that. Um, Physical activity is essential for good health. I don't think anybody can argue with that one. And um, it's not, uh, I mean, obesity is a big problem, but it's just a simply byproduct of being inactive. And people who's physically active live longer and better lives. <clears throat> and even they say uh, uh, it's better to be fat and fit than thin and unfit. That I never heard it before, but this is coming from, again, uh, from medical experts. So um, basically, how can we live actively? I mean, physically active, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, active living in a way that, you know, the description is that, you know, we, uh, the way of life that integrates physical activity into our daily routines, uh, such as you just walk to, you know, stores or destinations or ride bicycle to work, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, you'll see that there's a, I put a, just this kind of like separation here. Because, uh, you know, exercising such as, at a gym is okay too, uh, but th there's a big difference between these these two approaches. One is uh, basically we're making physical activity part of our lives, uh, versus that uh, we just you know after work we go to the gym and work out for two hours. We're still physically fit, healthy, but uh, the way they work is completely different uh, philosophies. <clears throat> uh, let's come to the point of. Was, was planning and its regulatory arm of zoning. And uh, whenever you open a, a zoning code, uh, first sentence or maybe in the first uh, you know, page of it, you will definitely see this statement. This is uh, zoning and planning is to promote uh, you know, health, safety, and welfare. Um, but the health officials, those are sort of experts on, on health, telling us that we as planners or developers or just in charge of this you know, built environment, we're not doing such a good job with promoting health. And that's where I'm going to focus. <clears throat> How does built environment impact our, our health? Uh, this is my personal opinion. However, I, I think there's probably there will be consensus. But uh, whenever we have more automobile oriented, low density, single use type of you know, development pattern with very low connectivity and, of course, uh, coupling with automobile culture that we have in this country, that uh, it's very likely that we're going to have uh, less 
physically active lifestyle because we will be sitting in our car all the time, we'll be sitting in our offices, we'll be sitting at home. So um, the opportunity to uh, become physically active and, uh, and do things at the same time is getting less and less. Um, this is an image from our town. It's also a 1604 area. And um, the, actually the, the neighborhood, there's these are like chain of neighborhoods that they were so large that you know, they, they couldn't fit in the pictures because I want to show you that uh, each house, uh, or actually each, each street here, uh, they have sidewalks. And the, their main you know, collector, they have um, bike lanes. But do we really see people here you know, walk to destination, just I described before, to conduct their daily lives? What they can walk to. I mean, even though there's sidewalks, yes, I see that, but you know, probably the nearest store is maybe three, maybe five miles you know, uh, away from their home. So, in an environment like this, even though all the, let's say, required infrastructure is in place, but the context of this development pattern does not promote walking, therefore, does not promote really um, active living lifestyle. Whereas, a place like this, uh, this is not San Antonio. <laughs> uh, uh, and also this, uh, this is in Europe, this is in Barcelona, and um, they, they were built prior to you know, automobile and, uh, introduction. So uh, they, uh, this is not uh, La Cantera, the people you know, just parked right on the other side of the building and just walk there. This is, entire city is, is like this, so block after block, it's all connected, you know, fabric of urban space. And in a place like this uh, versus the other one, uh, the other one you have to have, this is a precursor to be able to live here, is you have to have a car. Otherwise, you cannot function here. You cannot live here. You cannot go anywhere. And um, so this is, this is what we designed. Just, you know, Chuck mentioned earlier that this is our new uh, you know, experiment in our you know, uh, history. And this is the old one. And old one is still you know, working well. It's thriving. And uh, even though we introduced cars uh, after we built this uh, you know, environment, and it's, it's hard to live with a car here because it's, it's pain in the neck that you, know, you have to find parking. It's very hard. It's very expensive. And obviously, you cannot speed here. So you know, just probably walking is you know, faster than driving. So these are two different you know, mentalities, two different worlds, two different type of built environment. And, and um, I think it's hard. It's not hard to say that you know environment like this uh, encourages more like healthier lifestyles. Well, um, I have some more images that uh, after this point I would like to focus on. Um, I want to use the word scale of type of uh, development patterns. At one end of the scale, this is, these are purely uh, pedestrian you know oriented uh, places. These are all from different continents different cultures, but they're all speaking very similar language. And uh, they're all close to you know, traffic uh, and the height and the um, you know, size of the you know, buildings and, and, the, and the public realm is very similar. And yet you'll see that it's, it's full of people uh, that are either going somewhere or, do, uh, or doing something. But uh, just like Chuck said, it, this is generating one heck of a revenue uh, per acre versus the one we you know, saw before. And, um, and also I would like to mention that this is, this is the one that the place that I was born at and some of my childhood went into, um, spent on this very same street and um, I'm very familiar with the you know, environment. And here, this is from Texas. This is actually mostly from San Antonio. This is Dallas. Uh, this is, I, I think this is such a shocking a picture that um, I just wanted to you know, put it over there, but the uh, rest of it is, uh, I believe this is uh, Bandera you know, 1604 area, and this is Bandera 1604 uh, shopping center. That this is the uh, built environment we created here in this town. As you see, again here, uh, it was a bus stop, and it was a sidewalk, uh, but you, you hardly see anybody. I mean, you may see just you know, a few people during the day, but uh, most of the people will be obviously driving. And this environment is the built environment that we have here right now, built on just one focus, that is to accommodate automobile. And um, as I mentioned before, 
the more the, you know environments we produce, it will be harder for ourselves to get you know physically fit or uh, have a life that you know uh, full of physical activity. Um, here, this is a, this is you know subdivision. Here is a big shopping center. Even though if you're living here, this is the nearest house uh, to the subdivision, you still have to. Uh, probably go a mile on the other direction and come back and on this collector to be able to uh, get to this uh, shopping center. There's no way people, you know, will walk. And uh, even though if you're going here, uh, you know, just going to some other store, uh, it's not going to be a pleasant walking um, you know, ex experience. So um, <coughs> in new urbanism, um, you know, movement, basically there's not really nothing new about new urbanism because basically we're, uh, promoting the old one, and as I mentioned, this is the this is the scale. This is one end of the scale. This is pure, uh, you know, pedestrian, and the other one uh, we saw is is pure automobile. So uh, basically, any anywhere in between is uh, hopefully will be better than this. But at the same time, Chuck mentioned with the futon, you know, uh, example that you know somewhere in between may not be the the best option either because it's not going to function well enough to satisfy either of them. Uh, so in the uh, new urbanism approach that uh, hopefully the scale will be, uh, the needle will be closer to this end of the scale. And yes, there will be some cars, you know, there's no way they will go away. But uh, as long as we keep the focus on, uh, on pedestrians in, in human scale, I think we will make some progress. And this concludes my presentation. Okay. Okay. Christine. Thank you, John. This is the intermission side of the show here, or part of the show. Just, uh, we can't really see anybody out there, so you're all in silhouette, so I won't tell, but um, how many of you took the bus to the conference today? Wow, two people, I thought we'd have a whole handful. Okay, and if you're probably under 25 too. Um, and also, I just want to get an idea of who's in the audience. If you're architect, planner, um, urban designer of that ilk, raise your hand. Health professionals. All right, we got a lot of those. Just call out if you're not one of those two groups. What are you? Community outreach, okay, great. Parks. Was that Parks. Parks, okay, wonderful. Emil, was well, tired? Potter, <laughs> did we hear? Retired. <laughs> oh. um, thank you all for coming today. Uh, our keynote, I really, really enjoyed. I'm an architect, um, or at least I play one on TV, um, but more of a planner, and I work for VIA as a project manager for urban design. Um, but also, my background is a lot in community development. I used to be the uh, executive director of Southtown, which kind of influences the way that I see San Antonio, because I came to San Antonio from DC, which was a you know, wonderful environment. I didn't have to have a car, walked everywhere, weighed 50 pounds less because of it. Um, and then you come to San Antonio, and you don't have that kind of environment. So um, I'm going to quickly go through, because John actually touched a lot uh, as well. This is the only slide that I'm going to have of a streetcar, and if you have any questions about streetcar after this, I have a colleague in the back, and I'm going to send them all to him. Okay. Um, when I looked at, you know, how does transportation and health connect? If we just go to SA 2020 and look at some of the language, you know, an efficient transportation system is critical. Um, the effect of transportation on health and fitness, uh, transportation can help with placemaking. And those that um, choose to walk or ride a bike are going to be more healthy, um, even though it does say instead of driving or riding a bus. But that's the point, is that regardless of your, and can you hear me in the back? Because I can't, okay, thank you. Um, regardless of your transportation mode, which can be many, um, whether it's the vehicle, a streetcar, a bicycle, a pedestrian, um, we can all use the roadway. And I like the uh, historic picture that was shown earlier. This is uh, Houston Street, um, where, where you know, everybody, a pedestrian, cars, transit, is all operating in the same roadway and quite efficiently. Um, there's a variety of types of pedestrians who are all sidewalk users. You have a lot of children, 
um, some that are not as abled as others, uh, many different age groups. Um, I'm always fascinated with uh, the discussion of where you place a sidewalk against a curb. And I say, you know, if you're going in a street that's 45 miles an hour and you have a sidewalk that's right against the curb, do you want your 80-year-old mom or your two-year-old child against that curb? No way. Um, John already kind of showed you what our development pattern has been thus far and what we're trying to transition to in terms of going from a very suburban um, environment to an urban environment that promotes walking and different types of um, urban development. And we look at that in terms of, you know, what does our public infrastructure have to do with that? How can it connect neighborhoods and what are the building forms and densities that help support public transit, which then helps support a very walkable environment? Um, so the idea is more people and fewer vehicles, showing you know, the same number of folks uh, that are on the road is the same number that you can get in one vehicle. So the next time you're behind a bus and you say, dang, I wish that bus would move because I'm stopped behind it. Imagine if every person in that bus was in a car, you'd be, have 40 cars in front of you instead of one vehicle. Uh, so again, showing how much ro roadway single occupancy vehicles take up. So if we can reduce the number of folks through public transit and other means by walking and bicycling, we've got a lot more space on the roadway for things like parallel parking that supports local business and is much safer for the pedestrian. Um, when we look at types of development um, that are focused around transit or what we call transit-oriented development or TOD, we try to cluster those areas along a corridor so the trips that you take every day can be uh, much more aligned and you can get, um, you can take public transit to, uh, on one line and get off at different stations that you don't have to go all over the city for that. And then at the station area, we want to focus those uses um, that are much more around that quarter mile or half mile um, radius. For FTA purposes, which we live our lives by, um, the general rule of thumb is if you're within half a mile of a transit stop, they consider you accessible to transit. Or if you're within three miles, you're accessible um, by a bicycle. So again, looking at the, the uh, core diagrams, that you, within that quarter mile, you can have basically about three different neighborhoods, or within half mile, about 12 neighborhoods. Um, the framework that helps support TOD, and I will tell you that Avia and the city of San Antonio are working hand in hand right now to help develop policies that are going to support transit-oriented development, which looks at how land use can um, go hand in hand with transportation, the densities that are going to help us um, accommodate all the new growth that San Antonio is going to have over the next a few decades, um, what that urban design and placemaking looks like, and um, what do we do about parking um, and reducing those parking requirements. And there's a great book called um, the, the High Cost of Free Parking, that whenever you have lots of areas with low cost or free parking, it encourages driving. So the more that we can raise our, our parking rates, the more we're going to have a lot more uh, successful transit. Just to compare a square mile each of an inner city neighborhood, I believe this happens to be on the left, um, Alta Vista, which runs uh, basically between San Pedro and I-10, uh, just south of Hildebrand. Um, and a suburban neighborhood, I think that is somewhere in Stone Oak. Um, look at the number, the population. You can serve five times the number of people in that same area um, with double the, number, double the number of parcels because you're going to have a lot more density within um, the uh, left side gridded system. And the way that that pattern of development affects transit is that when you start looking at how you operate transit vehicles through a neighborhood and how people and households can have access to public transit, you want to make sure that you've got at least that half mile distance. So in a square mile, everybody can have access to transit when you're on a basic grid. Try doing that. I can't even, you know, bring in another layer on the right because it just doesn't work. Um, so that's what John um, I want to reiterate was that he was talking about our new development patterns and how those uh, more suburban sprawl type of patterns just simply 
don't support transit. And that's why you will see um, a lot of the outlying service that we have at only one bus an hour, uh, because it's very, very difficult to get through those areas. And then if they're gated communities, we can't, we can't get there at all. So what we're really trying to do is transform the public realm, and these are all photos of San Antonio, um, to something that's much more walkable. Um, this is Fred Road. Uh, prior to BRT, we did do some improvements um, with bus rapid transit along Fredericksburg Road. But if you see the type of pedestrian path that someone has to go through, who wants to go through that? And the distance between intersections or signalized intersections where it's safe to cross the street is so great because your block length is so long that you become, as a pedestrian or somebody in a wheelchair, really becomes human targets. And we've seen a lot of evidence um, in that around the city. So this is, um, you know, what we're trying to do. John and I both love Barcelona, so we <laughs> both independently picked photos of that uh, city. Um, but having the pedestrian environment that supports vehicles, bikes, everybody together, but does not place the focus on the access to the pedestrian. Um, I look at two examples where you have very minimal right-of-way, which is the, the, often the, oftentimes in San Antonio we have very, very tight constraints about what we do. But as you can see in other cities, you can have a small amount of, or a very narrow m amount of right-of-way and still it's a beautiful place to go through. Um, sharing the road, I think as we become more and more accustomed to bikes and pedestrians using the same roadway, we're going to see more of these types of signs. Um, just one example locally, this is on um, South St. Mary's, right there at the river, and, uh, a bus stop. Look what's going on. I mean, if we look a little bit closer, You've got somebody reading, you've got the transit information pile on there, you've got some trash cans, you've got the weenie man selling um, hot dogs, and everybody just kind of hanging a little, not too orderly, and the people who are not at the bus stop that have to pass through there get a negative impression about what's going on at the bus stop when that really shouldn't ha have to happen. So here's a prototype in, in Paris that they uh, did. What if you provided places where people could go to the bus stop and park their cars? And then you added beautiful areas to sit with a map behind them, maybe a little community library where if you want to read to stop, um, whether you're a transit rider or not, you can do that. The weenie man can come in and have his own little stand undercover. You've got great uh, up-to-date transit information on your screens there, and everybody's happy. Um, and so it can become a very different place in the environment on the street with just a little bit better urban design. I would be remiss in not bringing up at least one VIA project. Um, as of 2015, which I guess is next year, the West Side Multimodal, for those of you who don't know, as you take Houston West to Dead End into Medina, uh, we do own the, um, where is the, is it the red one? Oh well. The transit center there is the 1907 um, historic transportation terminal there at the axis of Houston. Um, we have acquired the entire city block there to um, transform it into a transit plaza focused on the pedestrian. So this is expected to be a place of destination where you can have a vista from the northeast uh, at Frio and Travis through the plaza to the dome of the transit center. Um, the, the little areas on the right underneath a circular canopy that ser serves as um, waiting areas for the bus around the entire block can be used um, by uh, food trucks. So it'll become a very, very vibrant um, environment where, you know, cars, bikes, peds, and um, transit vehicles all intermingle. Um, have a public art uh, signature piece. There's going to be an 85-foot um, high lighted tower there, so great photo at night. Be all very safe right next to the county jail. And um, so this is the story. Regardless of transit mode, everyone starts as a pedestrian. And if we begin to change our development patterns to focus on pedestrian access instead of the vehicle, we can begin to design our road networks. I won't read all of this, but 
All of this, as we design better, will result in better air quality, as Peter mentioned, better TOD, and economic development opportunities, better and uh, more places to walk on a daily basis, better and less expensive environments for our future generations, um, and make for a leaner and healthier community. So those communities that do have better pedestrian access, which are traditionally in the inner city, there's been documentation that shows when you add your housing and transportation costs as part of your total expenditures, you're going to um, have that much less. And so your transportation costs, for example, if you lived in downtown, $376 a month versus Stone Oak at $1,045 a month, what you're paying on transportation. So the idea of connecting what you pay in housing and what you pay in transportation has to be um, part of a, the same equation. So I invite all of you to join the Fab Four, who are our you know, most famous pedestrians, and get on board. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Now we have uh, Professor Kamal. Good morning, everyone. You hear me well? Yes. Okay, great. Um, what else to start with other than the highlight in New York? Um, uh, what, what this presentation is about is actually to wrap up the professional and multidiscipline uh, approaches and how we prepare our students for um, joining the job market and helping the professionals and be prepared to tackle uh, urbanism and planning issues um, in cities like San Antonio. So, um, and I, I intentionally actually address it in an urbanism and planning because not all the, all the planning are just about urbanism. We have, uh, we have suburbans everywhere. So um, I'm talking a little bit here about the, the APA, but also not only the um, uh, American Planning Association's kind of specialization or areas of concentration, uh, but we're gonna start to see how the, um, uh, boundaries between disciplines started to dissolve and not only between the disciplines within our um, college and education and architecture and urbanism and planning. So uh, starting with what the APA defined as a common set of specialization or areas of concentrations for uh, uh, programs um, prepare students uh, with a planning degrees. Uh, we have land use planning, environmental planning, economic development planning, transportation planning, housing and community development planning and recently we started seeing a specialization on geographic information system kind of equip students to tackle all these um, five specialization with more um, credible and reliable scientific approaches um, uh, for assessing the communities. We also started see public health and healthy communities as a separate specialization or areas of concentration and sometimes we see them as a sub discipline or sub-specialization under number five, which is housing and community development, which we also see in neighborhood analysis in that uh, discipline. Uh, basically, we started focusing this in, in uh, particularly in my classes, I'm talking to myself, but not only the planning discipline or the planning organization, we started seeing the sub-discipline of uh, health and public health and community health uh, just Two weeks ago in the Design and Health Summit in Washington, D.C., we started seeing uh, the health issues started to be addressed um, kind of um, 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 strongly in, in an ocean by everyone and the keynote speaker who's the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, Surgeon General, by the way, uh, who showed up in, as a keynote speaker. Um, and um, um, a strong message coming from the AIA itself, the, the president of the AIA, talking about the health is not anymore, it's, a, it's not a building typology, which is not a healthcare a building, it's not clinics, not hospitals. So we're not waiting until a problem happens and then we solve it as architects. I'm an architect by myself, by the way, so by practice as well. Uh, and here's, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting some excerpts from uh, the quotes uh, addressed in that conference. And the first one is the paradigm, uh, um, and I'm quoting here the U.S. Uh, Surgeon General, 
uh, the paradigm shift of uh, recognizing the health effects of every space and building and speaking to foster health is a critical uh, next step for the building professions. Um, quoting again, or quoting more, the president of the AIA uh, who said this strong message, architecture profession is stuck thinking about health either as a typology of hospitals and clinics or simply as disease mitigation and prevention. Barely we talk about communities um, as a mindset, as an architect. It doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, but the typical mindset is stuck into the, the typology. And on the other hand, we started seeing also this notion of interprofessional and uh, uh, multidisciplinary kind of um, uh, speech about tackling health issues coming also from the health, uh, public health professionals. So I'm quoting here also the task force of the Association of Schools of Public Health two years ago, uh, saying that a growing importance of uh, interprofessional approaches to the education and practice of health uh, professionals is, is coming up. So we started seeing this paradigm shift and uh, the boundaries between uh, urban designer, urban planners, architects started to dissolve. And not, not only that, we started seeing collaboration in research and, and teaching. And here we are in the second year. We have uh, students outside presenting their work on uh, smart growth and, and walkability and assessing um, how we can make our neighborhood more walkable for healthy and active living. And we have a project last year just assessing the components of act active living uh, on the neighborhood scale. And um, um, in a minute, I'm going to give some examples of their work. But uh, what do we do in our curriculum to address the public health issues? Uh, what we did is like we have students engaged with communities, with uh, public health professionals, uh, engaged also through problem solving approaches, uh, having a project based uh, curriculum developed around a certain issue uh, to tackle and we hope to get to what Peter um, talked about like the ozone and, and looking at air quality and maybe looking at just the multimodal kind of assessment uh, or where buses are. Uh, that's as an issue or one project at a time. Uh, and unfortunately, like also we still uh, developing the curriculum ar around multi um, attributes or multi variables so the students could be prepared for whatever the discipline, but maybe we're gonna get there when we have like more specialization on environment quality or, um, uh, or transportation uh, planning. Uh, we have students um, all the time interacting with professionals uh, we address the needs for job market, but also we care a lot about what uh, uh, scientifically and, and credibly the students will use quantitative uh, analysis measures and softwares uh, to be prepared for, for um, addressing issues uh, credibly and uh, scientifically. Um, the way we also create the, the pedagogy through, uh, to address the curriculum um, that address all these disciplines and prepare students. Uh, we use um, different computer technologies, we use softwares, we have lab instructions, um, uh, GIS, we have a good partnership with ISRI, Environmental Science Research Institute, um, the, the creator or the founder of the, uh, uh, the ARC GIS. We use a lot of quantitative measures, uh, student test their measures, so they can work out of real data from multi, actually, partnership with agencies. Um, the appraisal district, the city of San Antonio, is a lot of the data that you have on the web or we acquire it from uh, your people. So uh, we have them work in real projects and they look at what the city is up to and they respond to those in their classrooms. Uh, they do statistical analysis, so I'm not gonna list those, but I want to walk you through the number of images produced uh, actually last year by a group of students uh, individually. So we have them look at uh, strategic assessment of healthy hubs. This is uh, part of the Metro Health um, kind of notion started uh, uh, on the west side, correct me, David Clear, if he's here, correct me if I'm wrong, but we started looking at number of projects of assessing what are the healthy hubs, how they define it, how we can have a good strategy for uh, food desert uh, areas. Uh, so we work in collaboration and partnership and building on what the uh, local government and local initiatives are. So we're not gonna have students who are dreaming with projects. They, they're actually working for uh, um, reality projects. 
Um, they do create their own quantitative measure. On the far right, you see a graph of the quality of bike lanes within the neighborhood. So when we have these numbers and their location visually addressed on a map and give it to the community, and many times we present to the community, um, uh, associations uh, or bring the community association uh, staff on board here to the campus to talk uh, to our students throughout the process and by the end uh, they can have these numbers and this is really um, accurate it's scientific and uh, it is there and then they can use it maybe to allocate the resources to ask for more money or to to have their own strategies uh, for improvement um, um, the second one from the left you see uh, that's uh, one of our star students, Nishma, she's done an active living um, assessment for one of the West Side neighborhoods, Avenida Guadalupe, last year. And what she has done, basically, she used multiple colors to combine multiple attributes or multiple variables of the physical activity plan that could be measured and addressed to see where are the gaps in the area within one neighborhood to, uh, to provide that fit or the, the the po possibility for people to be fit, as John Austin was just talking about. So we have them engaged uh, together as teams, also part of the skills they need to acquire before joining the job market, uh, but also to work with community. Um, I was just told, by the way, by my students outside that they were asked by the, uh, uh, the council uh, woman that she uh, wanted them to present their work that's out there in the uh, Gardendale neighborhood, which is what we want out of an event like this one. And I'm gonna wrap my presentation very quickly with this uh, kind of intro sheet. This is available outside. If you could just chat with the students and grab one of these sheets. It has on the other side some instructions or how to make an assessment for the posters outside. And we're gonna select a winning project by the end of the day. Um, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Asad. Okay, we have a few minutes uh, for questions, uh, comments by our audience. Yes, sir. I grew up in Canada for about five years, and the Nova Scotia Motor Vehicle Code says a pedestrian just has to hold their arm out and all the cars must stop <laughs> anywhere. And I'm wondering if we are not bringing up this issue that we need to talk to the Texas legislature. We need to talk about, wait a minute, within our communities, I don't know, it's shocking, and I've already heard the, the huffs, but we need to start talking about if, our, if we're gonna have this serious conversation, we need to have it addressed um, at the legislative level as well, I believe. I'll let anyone address that. Okay, I didn't really hear the first part of it, but I'm, let me see if I can rephrase the question. How are we as a community going to start looking at the likely conflict between the ped and motorist? Okay, thank you, I was putting it lightly. Um, there, was a, there was one of the photos that John showed up there that had the, um, vehicles on the crosswalk. Um, I've often wanted to take a survey in San Antonio and to see how many people understand what a stop bar is. Um, when you come to an intersection, there's a solid line that's called a stop bar. That's where you're supposed to stop your vehicle. Um, I think, um, and as a pedestrian, you know, you really do take your life in your own hands here in this city. Um, both as a pedestrian and as a cyclist. You know, if you go to Europe and see motorists drive, they are constantly, you know, looking over their right shoulder to see if that cyclist is coming behind them or, you know, if, if a ped is coming from the right side uh, crossing. Um, it is not, for the most part, innate in our culture to um, consider the pedestrian. If you go on San Pedro right in front of SAC, and look at that um, pedestrian crossing, 
Every car must stop by law once there's a pedestrian in the street. Um, it's amazing that we have not had a lot of deaths, that it is, it is um, you know, and the one here as well. I think this one's a little bit more protected because it's so close to the intersection. A lot of times the traffic's not going as fast. But um, I think there's a paradigm shift in the city that must take place as to how we address the pedestrian, not as a low life that doesn't have a car, but that somebody is either um, being healthy, <laughs> um, choosing to help the environment, uh, perhaps doesn't have a vehicle, or um, wants to take advantage of um, a commercial district that does exactly what it's supposed to and provide a variety of services in a short walk period. Um, but you're, you're right on target. I don't have a solution for it except for public education. I know we at VIA have had to do a lot of that in terms of you know, how you interact with a bus and a bus stop and the pedestrian uh, traffic around a bus stop. Um, but I would certainly welcome um, ways in which we as a community can start that dialogue. I appreciate the question, though. Okay, we're running short on time. Does anybody else want to ask a question or make a comment? I just wanted to follow up on that point because, um, you know, I, I just wanted to follow up on this point because I think he made a, a really important point that maybe didn't quite sink in. Is, and like, his issue or his question is that um, the law really disadvantages pedestrians. And, and when we look at pedestrian safety, the way it's kind of implemented, it's by adding additional restrictions to pedestrian movement. And so even to say that you know, the, the stop bars are, are not respected implies that the pedestrians need to be in the crosswalks. And, and what he was pointing out of it is that um, in other cultures, and cultures that are less auto-dominated, the pedestrians have the priority. And so shifting the culture mindset from saying um, auto transit has priority over pedestrian transit, um, to really take care of the pedestrians, pedestrians should have the priority. Okay, well, I'll just make a little comment on that. The city of San Antonio has just adopted a complete streets policy, and our definition of complete streets is where as many modes as possible can coexist on a roadway safely. The safety part is part of the challenge for urban design, transportation planners, and, and urban planners to be sure that that new complete street has that ability and that will have that outcome. That's our policy. We have an objective of tripling the number of complete streets in the city in the next five years. So at least there's an objective assessment and an objective uh, proactive approach to that. Although, of course, we're only talking about 15 or so miles of streets out of thousands, but it's a start. Any other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. A real quick comment about that. I really appreciate the work that you're doing, and I appreciate the work that all the folks from the city of San Antonio are doing on this issue. But, and I mentioned this to you earlier, I live very close to the Broadway-Hildebrand intersection. We've just spent $16 million on that project. $16 million investment to move traffic faster. And yet the sidewalks that were put back in were 32 inches wide with light standards in the middle of them. So we spent $16 million to make it easier to get traffic through downtown, because Broadway and Hildebrand is downtown, and made it much harder for pedestrians to use that intersection. So it's great to hear all these things, and it's great that the city's adopted a complete streets policy, but when does that actually, this really isn't a question, it's just an editorial comment, <laughs> when do we actually see that in projects that are being constructed? Should be in the next round of bond issue projects. I think that one was from the last round when that wasn't a policy. Okay, we need to move on to the next session, but thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed the, the comments, and thanks for participating.